system configuration. Now, as you'll notice, we reached the end of chapter eight. And if you remember, if I go back, the Python tests, it says can be redone at the end of the chapter. Um, at the end of this chapter, we're in chapter eight, but I'm sure when I've done this before, I'll try it again now just to be sure, because you know, I need to know, I need to try and find out why it's not working. I'll rebuild Python, um, but I'm pretty sure I'll get the same results. So let's do that now. And I'm just rebuilding this just to be able to run the tests. Um, it does say the known to hang indefinitely in the partial LFS for environment. Well, it's still partial in that there's no way to boot, but um, and some of the configs uh, haven't been installed, some of the configuration files. But as I say, the thing is, it says if desired, the test can be rerun at the end of this chapter or when. Python 3 is reinstalled. So in theory, we're at that place. It should work based on those instructions.
Okay, that's compiled. So now I'll run the test and see if it gets stuck at the same place it did previously.
Okay, well, that did actually get to finish in the end, so um, clearly it does seem to work now at the end of the chapter. I'm, I'm pretty sure several times before I've run this at the end, and it's um, there's been no difference in the results. Uh, there was one failure, um, which is not mentioned in the book. Um, it says it's to do with test curses. Um, I can't really see why that happened or even whether it's anything to worry about in particular. Like I said, there's no mention, although uh, saying that the tests don't seem to be a big deal for Python anyway, um, especially as they've got the instructions to run the tests in, embedded in the paragraph rather than the separate box. So I guess really uh, there's not a lot else we can do apart from carry on and finish the system. Obviously everything's worked so far that's been compiled using Python. So, yeah, kind of a bit of a, a moot point as to whether that test has proved anything or not. So, I'll, what I might do is leave that there and just test it in the, again, in the real environment and see if there's any change in that environment rather than running in the true environment. So I'll leave the directory there. So yeah, we're going on to system configuration now. And this is where we create a few um, configuration scripts to uh, either configure the environment, configure the disks and so on, or just general preferences such as uh, time zones and so on. Uh, little things like that, networking and so on. Um, this explains about how system V works. LFS boot script. So this is the package that had a problem with the uh, the initial download had a different signature from the one in the book. And it turns out the one that downloaded was the incorrect version. So we should now have the correct version because I checked that last time. So we'll just extract this, change into it and do make install and it installs all the required boot scripts as you can see there. Uh, there's a section here on device and module handling and history behind it and how UDEV has taken over it. How it works, how to get around problems, how to load modules automatically and so on. If they're not, or rather, load them manually if they're not loaded automatically. Network devices. Um, it does say that some network devices get renamed. I've, I've actually never, or well, it says they used to get, get changed. Um, uh, I think it has says that the new naming uh, scheme can also rename them. Um, but I've only ever found that they're named the same, certainly within the same distribution. They're, they're consistent names. Uh, so we can create some rules with this script. And if we inspect this file here, we can find out what it's deemed to call the network interface. And the name is that one there in this case, ENO1. So we'll need to know that for when we configure the device, the, the network device. There's some more information there dealing with duplicate devices and so on. 
So I'll go on to general network configuration. What I tend to do is just copy this and then go back and modify it as I need. So that's created that ifconfig.e0. Um, you can leave that as e0 or you can actually rename it to eno1. Uh, yeah, it's this bit here, I think. Uh, All right, if the procedure in the previous section was not used, you dev will assign a network card interface name based on the system physical characteristics such as EMPS1. Um, if you're not sure what your interface name is, you can always run IP link or LS sys class net after you've booted your system. So one I generally use is IPA. It shows the um, alternative name there. Um, that's the name that the system has given it. So there's actually two names. The interface names depend on the implementation configuration of the UDEV daemon running on the system. The UDEV daemon for LFS will not run until the system is booted, so the interface names in the LFS can always be determined by running those commands on the host distro, even in the true environment. Right, okay, I understand that. So basically the implementation of the host may mean that the interface name is different to what it will be in Linux from scratch. So um it could be that you um use the device name that you devs given you and when you come to boot linux from scratch it doesn't actually work um even though i thought the old idea was that they're consistent uh, but obviously the different Im implementations could uh, break that consistency so it's probably best to stick with eth zero now once we're in linux from scratch um, we could modify it to the device that Linux from scratch comes up with or rather the UDEV supplied by Linux from scratch um, and that should be consistent all the time whereas for example I think as it said on the previous um, page if you had for example two or more interface cards then ETH0 could refer to a different card each time you boot up so um, we'll stick with ETH0 now just to get it going and then maybe change it after we've booted so let's edit ifconfig.eth0 uh, yeah the interface name we're going to use is eth0 we're using static ip4 addressing and what we've got to do is put in a, an ip address here so i'll just use one that's on the local subnet for example 200 gateway uh, and you'll have to get this from your own router or sysadmin uh, to find out what IP addresses are available for you to use. So they're the settings I'm going to be using. Uh, there is some explanation there about it. The etc resolve file. Again, copy that in and edit it. And if you've got a domain name, you can put that in there or just leave it blank. You'll have to re remove the red bit. And I use mynets.org. And the primary name server, well, I've got my own name server, so I'll put that in first. Um, and the secondary one I now use is run by an organization called, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. Let me just check it. Yes, Quad9 it's called, um, and they guarantee that the searches that you do on this name service are anonymous and no records are kept. So from a privacy point of view, it might be something that you want to consider using. Um, and they have two IP addresses, the primary one, and I think that's the secondary one there. And also for IPv6. So that might be something you want to consider using. Uh, so that's the domain name resolution. 
need to set the host name. So in between these quotes, you need to think of a name you're going to call the computer. So I might call it, for example, uh, LFS 12.0. I'm not sure if full stops are allowed actually, so I'll call it LFS 12 0. And then we've got a hosts file that needs to be created. And we can modify that. So what we need here, we need to keep the first one. Um, the second one I think I've read is not absolutely needed. It's used by certain distributions, I believe. Uh, I don't think there's a explanation of why that's in here. Uh, If I search for that, it might. Oh, it's a bug workaround. Okay, so you might want to leave that in there. Uh, I must admit, I've always removed it. Uh, I've never seen what the point is. Yeah, so there's an explanation about it there if you're interested. So uh, I'll leave it in there. It does say it needs to have the fully quite qualified domain name and the host name so the fully qualified domain name is the name of the computer so lfs 12-0 followed by the domain name so my net.org and then the host name is uh, lfs 12-0 and then the ip address we used before in the network config so I used that again the fully qualified domain name and the host name followed by any aliases that you want to use so we'll just copy that there paste it in there um, I don't need any more alias names for this computer so I'll just remove that uh, Twelve zero, and I don't use IP six, so I'll be deleting these. So that should be sufficient for the hosts config. Next, there's something here about uh, the boot scripts and how sysv starts up. So we need this init tab to tell it how to start up under certain conditions. There's a bit there describing the run levels for system V. And now we've got a configuration for the clock. And what this does is specify how the time is stored on the machine, if it's stored in UTC or GMT time, or if you're sharing the machine with Windows, uh, this would need to be changed to a zero to say that the time is not stored in UTC, it's stored in local time, which is how Windows would store it. As this is solely going to be used by Linux, we don't need to change that, just leave it as a one. There's some information here about the Linux console configuration. Copy that in and edit it.
uh, one thing we can add here is the log level. Uh, and by, if we don't set this, we'll tend to get kernel messages just random, well not randomly, but just appearing out of nowhere on the screen, which can be quite annoying. So I found that log level three is quite a quiet one. You'll just get to see like emergency um, high level messages that are uh, important. For example, if there's a memory uh, error detected or something like that, or um, some problem with the CPU, such as a thermal problem, you'll, you'll see a message come up or possibly even uh, segmentation faults, I think. So save that. Oh, um, the font I'm normally set to uh, what it is now how is it latin one uh, i think i'll set that to latin one normally and change that to a, a one as well for western europe so you'd have to find out what what you'd need there for the character set for your region. Uh, some examples here as well. There's uh, something there about considering syscalogd. Um, there's the rc.site file. There's some options you can tweak in there. Uh, it, it looks like it's something you should copy and paste in because it's in the box, it's in bold, uh, but it is actually already there. Uh, there it is. So it's just basically a copy of what's already on the disk. Uh, there's no settings actually activated by default, I don't think. I think they're all remarked out if you did want to change something then you can uh, change things here. Customising the boot and shut down scripts. Uh, some information there about that. Bash shell startup files. Um, so we need to set a locale for the system. And there's all the ones that are installed on the system. If you remember, we installed them uh, just after glibc was installed and a lot of these were installed to now allow tests to run and pass so what you need to do is to copy this um, and you need to take one of these locales so for example i'll take EN, let's take the default ENGB, put that in there, and it tell you what the character map should be used for ENGB. Um, and if you type in the remainder of these options, you'll get further information about that locale. So British English, char map we've looked at, the currency symbol, it will tell you about so Great Britain pounds and lastly oops the uh, international prefix that's the telephone prefix should come back with 44 which it does so what we've got to do now is to copy this script in and insert Uh, the results of that output so it's engb dot the char map uh, which was that and any modifiers after that will be followed with the at sign and then the remainder of the script to finish that here document off. 
that should be it. Input RC file is next, so we'll just copy this. It's got some configuration for the keys, for special keys like home and end, to get them interpreted and act as, as you'd expect. ETC shells specifies what um, shells are installed on the system. Well, SH points to like a default shell, and the only actual shell we've got installed is bash, so SH will point to bash. <coughs> 